Graham. Um, our next panel, as you can see titled in your program, is called The Bottom Line, Growing the U.S. Commercial Portfolio Through Partnerships. So we've heard a lot today about um, the hardware uh, of seagoing operations, the U.S. flag. We've heard about the infrastructure and the logistics supply chain. We've heard uh, about the policy perspective uh, from our keynote address. And of course, we heard uh, focused panels on either Arctic operations and on and or, depending on what you went to or both, uh, with the uh, strategic partnerships uh, across uh, alliance networks. And so we want to take a, a couple of moments uh, this afternoon to start focusing on commercial imports and exports. So I won't go through the entire uh, uh, description. You can read that in your panel um, uh, recap. However, uh, we're honored to have uh, a number of uh, folks from across the industry today that can specifically focus on commercial and operational uh, challenges with exports and imports um, in the United States. Uh, today's uh, after first afternoon panel will be moderated by Commissioner Carl Benzel. He's a commissioner at the Federal Maritime Commission. Uh, for the sake of time, again, I'm, I'm going to ask that everyone just read the biographies uh, out of the um, program for today. So, Commissioner Benzel. Um, hello, folks. Uh, it's uh, uh, an honor to be here again. I think this is the second time that I've uh, participated in the, in the Navy League's uh, uh, conference in this, and it's a bigger venue. I think it's justified. Uh, I see a lot of the cadets from the, uh, Kings Point and uh, New York Maritime out there, and uh, all sorts of friends. But um, maritime industries uh, is greatly undervalued in the United States. Uh, it is uh, a, a critical essentiality uh, for our nation's economy. Uh, we often talk about U.S. flag service in the context of uh, a merchant marine that can provide support to naval uh, operations and U.S. armed for uh, forces uh, as they go into battle, but there's a there's an element of of uh, national uh, security that has to do with our ability to work as a nation on a unilateral basis, and uh, I saw this uh, uh, firsthand during the pandemic. And I'm here as a regulator talking to you about business opportunities for the maritime industry. And our panelists, uh, I'm gonna let them introduce their, themselves, um, but uh, it's a very long title. Um, that really, when you parse it down, is about making money and, uh, and, and operating maritime businesses. And so, uh, so there's a lot of topics that, that, that encompasses. It encompasses some of these national security uh, obligations, uh, that the shipping lines uh, support. Uh, it, it also provides uh, national security on our ability to be, uh, as a nation, uh, making our own decisions on how and what we want to do. Uh, during the pandemic, I, I actually was a commissioner, just started as a commissioner, uh, and uh, two, two weeks later, I think there was the first uh, uh, notices of outbreak of the, of the COVID-19. And, uh, and, 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 and shortly thereafter, Chinese manufacturing was uh, closed down, and U.S. ports uh, went from, uh, from uh, full to about 20% reductions in, in containerized cargo during that time frame. And I remember writing a letter to the President of the United States uh, with uh, Commissioner Sola saying, we're going to have to uh, help the industry work their way out of this uh, terminals uh, pay their leases to uh, ports based on the volumes coming in, and if uh, if they uh, go into bankruptcy, we're not going to have anyone there to deliver our cargo. And uh, lo and behold, uh, three months later, uh, Chinese manufacturing had come back online, and we saw about a 30% increase in containerized uh, imported cargo over the next two years. Uh, during that time, Congress was wrestling with how as a nation we're going to uh, to, to sustain ourselves, and, and, and we passed the CARES Act. Uh, and the CARES Act uh, took care of a lot of segments of our industry, of our, of our nation's economy that were, were suffering. And so they gave, uh, they gave the aviation and transit industry $128 billion. And that industry basically had reductions uh, in service of about 90% for the next two years. 
The maritime industry, I think the Maritime Administration got $4 million uh, for some uh, fleet activations. But uh, what happened during that time frame? The critical essential services of maritime exploded and we were not able to accommodate the levels of service that were provided. And so I remember having meetings uh, with uh, top CEOs of major companies about not getting cargo and what this would mean. Uh, uh, auto deal, uh, auto man manufacturers not being able to get tires to put on their cars. And I said, well, you, you can't sell a car without tires. So what are you gonna do? And I said, we'll slow things down. Uh, uh, respirators, during the pandemic, we had a, a lot of problems with healthcare uh, providers getting the sort of resources they needed to in the United States. And, and the problem was there was just not enough space. And so what was happening was ocean shipping companies, and I don't, I don't, I don't blame them, I don't begrudge begr them, were looking at allocating their space based on their, their, their uh, competitive uh, needs uh, to tailor to a, uh, a, uh, uh, to a, a shipper or BCO. So decisions were being made that were outside of the scope or the ability of the United States government uh, to determine or affect. So we really need uh, to, to think uh, uh, long and hard about our reliance on ocean shipping. And I, I remember uh, talking to a large retailer. I said, how, long, how many of the uh, products you sell in your, in your store um, uh, are made in the United States? said uh, about 10%. And, and if you look at many of these retail uh, uh, complexes, I think you would find about 80 to 90% of everything that they sell is, is being uh, shipped. 90% of all overseas trade is carried on vessels. So this market affects our retail market, our food market, our, our market for construction, um, manufacturing, and, uh, and so it's a critically important function. In addition to everything else, we talk about national security and our ability to, to force project, project. So this is a good topic. It's a topic that we need to, to think about how we can sustain a maritime industrial base. And, and, I, and, I, and I, I, I include every aspect of the industry, from marine insurance uh, to uh, lawyers that work on shipping issues, to uh, longshoremen who work at ports, uh, to the manufacturers of equipment, to truck drivers and railroads that provide service to intermodal cargo, to the energy companies that uh, do production. So it's a, it's a comprehensive industry that touches every aspect of our nation. Um, I did wanna, before I turn it over to my panelists, uh, I wanted to talk a little bit of throwing out some ideas in certain areas uh, because really what this panel is about is how and where is our opportunity for the shipping industry uh, moving forward. And, and sometimes I think we sort of get confined in, in, our, uh, in our areas of, uh, of, of expertise and, and business and, and yet you have to have, have an opportunity to take a step back and look at where, uh, where, where could, could we go, where could we uh, get uh, benefits, uh, where could our industrial base in this area uh, uh, continue and, 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 and thrive. And so um, I did want to talk, I don't, Julie Nelson was going to be here uh, uh, to represent uh, the LNG uh, segment, uh, but uh, there's a lot of opportunity um, uh, in the future uh, in the energy area. Um, uh, wind energy, there's many, many issues related to our ability to project wind energy on the offshore uh, markets, the industry's wrestling with uh, really getting that uh, jump started. Uh, but there will be economic opportunities going forward. The degree of, uh, of, uh, of energy that is supposed to be relying on, on offshore wind uh, is substantial. It's a market that is waiting to be tapped, to be financed, to be implemented. The president is committed to uh, maintain the requirements of the, of the Jones Act to, to service that market, so the investment uh, should be uh, to U.S. corporations and, and U.S. actors and players. You know, we may have to look at some flexibilities, uh, uh, but, but, uh, but I would only look at that in the last 
the last throes of, of, of utilizing uh, our, our industry as opposed to someone else's. Um, I, I did want to also mention that the fuel, the transition to, to alternative fuels is a big, big market, huge market. Right now, only 10% of bunker fuel that is sold to vessels uh, is, is sold from U.S. markets. So it's not an incredibly big market for our fuel. Um, and so we basically are seeding 90% 90, 90 of the fuel sourcing to other nations. Um, we are going to go from one single fuel to potentially five or six uh, others by 2050. And IMO uh, requirements are going to mandate that we go to biodiesel and, uh, and additives and LNG and uh, methanol and ammonium uh, and, and, and potentially even nuclear uh, uh, fuel sources. So what does this mean? This means that uh, ocean, uh, giant, gigantic ocean liner companies container shipping lines that go back and forth are going to have to build vessels that can accommodate to the fuel uh, sources that they'll be able to get their hands on. Uh, Antwerp, for instance, the port of Antwerp is looking at the establishment of a green shipping corridor with, in conjunction with Houston uh, to be able to, to provide the sort of fuel, fuel that is needed. But we are going to go from a market where a vessel could go and, and get fuel anywhere to a market where they may have to plan how to get their fuel. So uh, there will be opportunities in servicing this. There will be opportunities for the implementation of technology. And, and, uh, and uh, most of the shipping lines that, uh, that I uh, talk to say, well, we're going to start off with LNG, but we are going to build the next generation of vessel with, uh, with uh, accommodation for biodiesel. Uh, so there's a market there uh, that we need to look at and consider and, and evaluate. And, and, and that is in conjunction with our energy industry. Um, I've, I've got Mark Sarconi here from the Journal of Commerce. I speak to him all the time about container shipping issues uh, and uh, our system of infrastructure strain. Uh, the, the container industry is gigantic. It, it, it seems to grow 4% every year. Um, and the existing port infrastructure, which is largely concentrated at three or four or five ports, is constrained. I mean, we're in New York City. New York City was a port before it was a city. Uh, but now the city is much bigger than the port, and 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 we were the ports, the potato ports are all over in New Jersey, and they're surrounded. They're surrounded by housing, and infrastructure, uh, and uh, the ability to move cargo through the gi uh, gigantic port complexes was severely strained during the pandemic. Uh, when we saw these increases of cargo. Uh, and so we're going to have to think of uh, alternative ways to move cargo. We should be thinking of inland port uh, destinations and express services, rail services at, at these large uh, port complexes. Alternative ports, uh, ports like Boston and, and Baltimore and, and Philadelphia that have, have room uh, in, in addition to, to express uh, services uh, going from the port of, of, of uh, New York City or New, New York, New Jersey, uh, directly to Buffalo on a rail a railroad car, where it's disseminated to uh, places in the, in the Midwest. Uh, and there's op there's opportunity in this. There's opportunity in de developing technology to, to to create these and alternative sites to store and handle it. And so uh, the industry should be looking at this. Uh, these intermodal service problems are probably the biggest challenge we have in containerized shipping. So there will be opportunity there. And so, uh, and, then, and then finally, I did want to talk about our US uh, flag fleet. Uh, we uh, transport less than 1% of the cargo on, uh, on US flag fleet uh, um, uh, vessels, and, uh, and that's just inadequate uh, for a maritime nation uh, such as the United States. We, we were, uh, an inception, a maritime nation. We left in large part because the British uh, were exerting navigational controls and controls uh, that uh, that mitigated against uh, the colonists' ability to, 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 to trade freely. If you look at the Constitution, it's replete with maritime transportation issues, uh, conferring the states the right to regulate pilotage, to say that the federal government cannot uh, take any 
uh, give any preference to any one port or, or facility, but it, it, it has historically always been the first commercial law um, that is set up in any any, uh, any nation. And so, uh, so as a, a maritime nation, having only uh, the capacity to carry one percent of your of your uh, of your products uh, is 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 just not is just not right. And so we need to do something better in this area. Uh, you know, maybe we need to be creative on this. Uh, uh, give uh, uh, tax uh, deductions for U.S. shippers that uh, uh, ship U.S. flag uh, on, on U.S. flag vessels, or, um, or 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 providing. Uh, you know, we have to do something different. And so, so uh, I, I would propose that our panelists are are in a good position to consider these issues and any of the issues that. Uh, uh, I, I brought up, and uh, it's a broad topic, uh, but it really is about maritime opportunities. And Mark, uh, I'm going to let all of the panelists uh, introduce themselves, and I'll fill in a little bit for uh, Julie as we go through the process and talk about LNG. Very good. Uh, thank you, Commissioner. Uh, Mark Sacconi, I view the Journal of Commerce. Um, it's a nearly 200-year-old publication. Uh, we're primarily focused on container shipping end-to-end. -end. Uh, we do a little bit on the Great Dolphin Special Project. Um, I've been reporting and analyzing the market for about uh, 15 years. And, you know, our interest um, kind of in this event has, has increased, um, partly because our readership and the attendees that come to our shipping conferences are increasingly uh, concerned about geopolitical headwinds. Um, it's coming up in meetings with container lines. It's coming up in meetings with shippers. Um, and, and in fact, we had uh, General Petraeus uh, speak at uh, TPM earlier in Long Beach in March at TPM, which is the largest container shipping conference in the world. Um, and that really speaks to how much uh, the dynamics have changed, where we have people in the very commercial sector asking about Taiwan, asking about China plus one, China plus two. Um, and, and in fact, uh, we have not announced our new keynote speaker for TPM 20. Uh, 24, but it will be, in fact, uh, likely somebody out of the geopolitical sphere that I think everybody in this room uh, knows very well. Um, so yeah, it's, it's an interesting time, uh, but at the same time, I think, you know, Carl hinted to some of this divide uh, between uh, the commercial and uh, the defense and uh, sea lift capacity. So looking forward to the discussion. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. I'm Jason Fear. I'm the head of uh, business intelligence at Potent and Partners. Uh, Potent is a 85-year-old uh, ship broker, started life as a ship broker. Uh, it's still about two-thirds of our business. I'm usually the oldest company on stage, so you uh, sort of trumped me there. Um, so um, I specialize mostly in LNG markets, uh, a little bit in LPG. Those are sort of critical uh, verticals for us. Um, I look a lot at sort of the impact of geopolitics, of regulatory changes, uh, as well as investment decisions on construction of new projects, uh, and then how those commodities sort of get spread around, allocated uh, based on price. Um, so I'm, I'm very interested to sort of uh, participate in the discussion. Hi, good afternoon. My name is Mickey Delbra, Director of Maritime Finance for Citizens Bank. Thank you to the Navy League for having me here today. Uh, thank you, Commissioner, for that introduction uh, into the topic, which, yes, it's a big topic. There's a lot to talk about. So from uh, my standpoint, I'm happy to provide a little bit of a uh, perspective of ship finance side. We haven't spent too much time today talking about it, but capital and where it's going to come from and who pays and how are we going to get paid back is a major component of whether or not you start a project in the first place. So. It's great to have ideas, but you also have to have someone to write the check, and I can put some, shed some light onto that process. I'm happy to talk about it. Always good to have money. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Patrick Kepler. I'm the regional manager and chemical manager for Intertanko. Uh, for those of you who don't know Intertanko, we're the Association of Independent Tanker Owners and Operators. So we represent about 180 companies that own 4,000 oil, chemical, and gas tankers. 
Uh, in addition, we have about 200 uh, associate member companies that run the gamut from maritime administrations, maritime organizations, uh, colleges. Uh, SUNY Maritime is uh, one of our fairly new and very active associate members, as well as energy companies, uh, charters, uh, anybody really who has to do with the tanker business. Uh, I would say that some, something that we've talked about all day long are also the issues that are most impactful to tanker owners at the moment. The first item is what are the new fuels going to be and how are we going to go about you know, engine configuration and purchasing the next 20 years worth of tankers to move bulk liquids around the world. And then the other issue that comes up consistently is the next generation of mariners uh, post-COVID, post-Russia, Ukraine, um, the tanker industry, like many in the maritime world, is uh, having trouble uh, filling billets on ships. So uh, we'll be uh, talking about those issues as well. Thanks, Commissioner. Okay, uh, let's see. Uh, I think I'm going to go to the money man, uh, the, fi the financier, to talk about what is what is the uh, industry's at the banking industry's appetite for financing uh, ship construction. Is there areas where you're seeing? And, and uh, on a related note, I uh, recently read that uh, the wind energy uh, uh, investments are, are are being reduced in terms of our uh, production of wind in the uh, offshore sector of the United States. So, so what's your projections on these sort of issues? Sure, uh, and, and I think it's important uh, to understand how a bank approaches a ship finance transaction. So maybe I can break it down into how we would do that process and it gives you a better understanding of each of the components and then we can go into the wind and, and how that's the, an investment decision as well and, and how we get there. So there's basically three main components that I think about when I'm looking at a ship finance transaction. The first being the asset, that's the ship that we would be financing. Uh, the next being the counterparty, who is it that we're lending to? And if we like both of those and, and they check all the boxes for us, then the structure of the transaction itself is, is important. So backing up to the asset, just to go into a little bit more detail, uh, what kind of ship is it? A bulker, a tanker, a container, a roto, and anything uh, uh, that floats on the water constitutes a ship, but these are vastly different uh, underlying fundamentals in each of those industries. The only thing that makes them the same is that they are steel, in most cases, floating on the water. Um, otherwise, the drivers of the demand and the supply side make them uh, attractive in different markets and at different points in the cycle. And so while you may have the window open in uh, a bulker segment, to lend into, to invest into, you could be in a completely different uh, time and place for a tanker. And so banks and, and also equity investors uh, are taking a hard look at where they are in the cycle. Um, and, and on that asset itself, is it a new build? Is it a second-hand vessel? Uh, where is it going to operate? What condition is it in? You do a survey. Has it recently completed its dry dock and special survey? Is that coming up? what kind of capex, the, the dollars, the big dollar amounts that you have to uh, spend just to bring the vessel up to whatever uh, the standard is to pass its class survey inspection. Uh, there's just a, a ton of technical components on the asset itself, what condition it is. If you go and buy a house, you have an inspector go and take a look at that house. You want to know top to bottom what's going on with that before you buy it. Same thing for a ship from both the equity and the debt uh, perspective. The, the counterparty, are they creditworthy? Uh, can we lend to them? If so, when and how are we going to get paid back? What's their reputation in the market? What's their experience? Have they done this before? Do they know this asset? How many people do they have working in the company? Where are they located? What does that office look like? Do they keep it clean? Because that's indicative of what they're going to be doing with their asset as well. How do they manage it technically, uh, commercially? How is it operated? Where is it operated? So all of that goes into counterparty risk, which is a massive component of our underwriting. Uh, and anybody doing business in uh, the industry where there are big, big dollar amounts at play, you have to be very comfortable that the people that you're working with uh, are staying up at night. <coughs> find ways to pay you back, 
and not staying up all night trying to think of ways how not to pay it back. Yeah. So if the asset checks out, if the counterparty checks out, then we get to the structure of the transaction, which for us, uh, we can be somewhat flexible. Uh, other banks may be more dogmatic in terms of sticking to the same formula, working uh, the, the same way. But the, the structure itself, and what do I mean by that? The advance amount, that leverage, if a vessel is worth $100 million, for example, we're, we're talking Jones Act, so that's not just to be realistic, um, how much are we going to actually lend? We are in the 50 to 60% loan to value range, so that means we'll write the, the check for half of the value of the vessel, and the owner or other equity interests are bringing up the, the other uh, percentage there. They have some skin in the game as well. Uh, the industry in chip finance got into some, some trouble with over levering uh, a decade ago when uh, asset values could only go in one direction, so it seemed at the time, and it was uh, not uh, unusual to see 80% or more leverage. But what happens when those values come down, uh, and now the loan is uh, a larger amount than the asset value, you no longer have uh, collateral, or you're, now you're under collateralized. So, um, other parts of the structure that we think about, uh, liquidity, how much cash do they have on hand? Can they pay for a rainy day situation that they didn't think about? How are they getting repaid? How are the vessels employed? Uh, are they on long-term time charter contracts where we have visibility of the cash flows? We know how and when that money is gonna come in to pay for their operating expenses, the principal and the interest of the loan, uh, or are they in the spot market, which is a bit volatile, uh, depending on the size of the asset you run, and, who your counterparties are and where you uh, uh, are serving those transportation uh, routes. Uh, other parts of the structure that are relevant are covenants. There are certain guardrails that uh, a facility alone will have in place that determine if the value of the asset starts to come, come up for one reason or another, either there's a very large order book, and now all those ships are worth less money as more new ships are being delivered because the demand for those ships isn't there, so the value comes down. Now it could impact, again, that, that cushion between how much the loan is versus how much the asset is worth. And so there are covenants that we will test with a valuation provided by the broker, uh, how much that asset's worth every quarter, every six months, whatever it may be. And if it falls below a certain percentage, then either the loan has to be prepaid at a faster rate, or equity needs to be injected, additional capital needs to be injected by the owners <coughs> to cure that covenant. Uh, and there are other similar types of covenants uh, and guardrails. I'm happy to talk offline and, and get more into those details. I'm uh, interested in the topic. And in addition though, let's talk about maritime security for a minute because this is the maritime security conference. You think about hard hat, uh, or rather combat helmet, wearing a black jacket, uh, a donning, automatic weapon coding, a special ops team peering over through the binoculars uh, over the bridge wing and searching the horizon for a threat, uh, maritime security to a ship finance guy means the, the security items that secure your loan. So we talk about maritime security and that's the mortgage, that's the insurance, the assignment of assurance, insurance, uh, assignment of accounts, assignment of earnings, and those are all of the sources of, of cash flow and value that the ship owner receives and has that is given to the bank or assigned to the bank and that way in case there is an event of default or the situation where the ship owner can't pay back their debt the bank takes over control of the asset and the benefit of the insurance the, the cash that's sitting in the account the share price over the company and basically steps into the shoes of being the owner and that's how they can protect uh, against the situation where they lose money. So all that being said, with the building blocks and what we look at, talking about industry-specific opportunities, uh, wind farms and build out of that industry, we on the senior secured lending side, where we take the first priority lien over the, the asset, the mortgage, uh, we want rateable information. We want historical median data that tell us what the rates expected to be that this vessel can earn in different markets over a long period of time, a long look back. Same for the value. What can we expect that this five-year-old MR tanker is worth? What's the high, what's the low, what's that range? Looking back over a 10 to 20 year period, and 
will this loan that they're asking for that we're willing to uh, to underwrite meet those parameters on a look back? And if we don't have that data to do that analysis, it makes it very difficult to make an informed uh, investment decision or lending decision. And so it sometimes uh, means that we just won't even put our toe into the water in a situation or, or in a sub-segment that is, is kind of so greenfield or nation. So for us right now, we have clients that do uh, invest and are building out their offshore wind uh, offerings through terminals that they're standing up on the shore side for the actual assets that they're building, SOPs, SOPs, et cetera. Uh, but we have not yet uh, gotten into that space, although we follow all the developments closely because uh, it's, it's a very important one to our clients, but for us, we also just need to understand how we're going to get paid back, and if that's a question that until we can answer that for ourselves, it's, it's not an area we're going to start lending money into. Uh, Patrick, uh, I, I have a long uh, historical uh, uh, relationship with Intertanko rep representatives. I, I got my first job as an attorney in the House of Representatives in the aftermath of the uh, Oil Pollution Act. And so we work very closely with, with Intertanko, which represents the higher caliber of uh, service providers in the tanker industry. And, uh, so recently we have a lot of uh, macroeconomic issues affecting the transportation of petroleum products, uh, specifically the Russia uh, sanctions. And uh, uh, my question is, uh, right now, 80% uh, of the world's fleet operates under flags of convenience. Um, uh, some of them are managed uh, appropriately, and there's oversight. Uh, others are not. I was actually at a conference at the Maritime Administration recently, and they uh, told me that you could uh, register a vessel for a single voyage, and it could have even been for a, a period of time, like 15 days or something like that, and uh, nations like Palau and, 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 and other nations are setting up registries that are purely fictional. Um, and so, uh, what does this mean? We've seen, you know, attempts to uh, sanction uh, uh, Russia and, and the evasion of that using sort of the, the abilities of, of the flexibility of maritime law. What does this mean for reputable operators, or what is it? What do you think it's going to mean uh, going in the, in, in the future for, for people that are complying with, with the law and, and, and operating uh, reputably? Thanks, Commissioner. I, I think that uh, oftentimes what happens when uh, some new regulatory uh, scheme gets put in place is that there's uh, sort of an initial punishment phase for everybody who's out there complying uh, to begin with. Uh, but hopefully, what you find yourself is that the enforcement starts to catch up uh, with the people who are working outside of the, the boundaries of, uh, of the laws and standards that are out there. And the companies that have the longer term charters with shippers are going to stick with the ones that they know are going to keep them out of the news cycle, uh, keep them uh, out, of, out of trouble with the uh, port state control. Uh, and so, you know, really, really, what you're hoping for in the in the long run is that uh, is that a positive compliance scheme uh, will will be more profitable in the long run than taking a, a shortcut uh, towards uh, transporting something over the near term. Um, uh, Mark, uh, we uh, we had a lot of discussion during the pandemic about sort of a, a reliance. Uh, the chippers had, and they, they've set up their own logistical services, essentially, and, and those services are what they use all the time. And, uh, during the pandemic, we had uh, usually between 100 and 150 vessels waiting for birth at a U.S. port for sometimes up to two weeks. Uh, and so during that time, uh, it, it would shift. It shifted from the West Coast to the East Coast. And, uh, but we, we saw sort of a, uh, I remember talking to you and Peter, uh, about the need to shift uh, uh, services and, and move uh, schedules around and, and try to use places that could accept cargo. And really, uh, there wasn't much uptake on it. What do you think that the, the shippers, the users of the sh uh, shipping services learned uh, during the pandemic uh, going forward in terms of, of uh, sort of the inflexibility of, of, of the, or, or their inability to adjust? Uh, so, uh, what's your thoughts? Yeah. I mean, 
we always talk about alternative tools, um, but sometimes the, the reality um, doesn't really allow them to have what you think. You know, I, think um, I think part of that has to do with just the amount of critical mass. And so if the carrier is looking at an IPI or an inland point, um, they're going to go through the port. That makes the most economical sense for them. Um, and I think you're seeing a lot of these huge load center ports as the carriers kind of consolidate their services, get better utilization, better operations as their operating costs go. Um, it, it makes it it makes it really hard. Um, I don't think there's that doesn't mean that there's not a spot for them. Um, you're seeing definitely ones have niches um, in say reefer shipping or different types of uh, commodities. And you know you're obviously having sweet spots with certain shippers, knowing that they can use this smaller port. Uh, for guaranteed service, um, I think you know if anything was a pandemic. I mean, it was the amount of volume was you know record. So I think more what has kind of occurred to the shipper more is just an understanding of just how much it did not really improve. In the sense that you know we saw the um, upstream pressure come from the, the cross docks and the warehouses, where you know it really came down to the lowly chassis which is the critical piece of equipment to move any kind of ocean container from point to point, unless you've got a crane picking it up and putting it on that kind of mobile train. And I think those are, that's the problem, is because that's, a, that's an issue that's taken by the private sector. And, um, you know, there's, there's VC money in there, so there's a, there's a hesitancy to expand too much. Um, so I think, you know, to a degree, there's, there's infrastructure, there's improvements that need to be built. But you know, I, I think you and at the agency realize that a lot of these things you can't invest your way out. These are it, it's almost like you've got to prod the commercial sector to figure out solutions. And sometimes, you know, there's not even solutions; it's just kind of workarounds that are going to take, and then you got to shift next month. It's uh, it's something that we we need to think about because there's just not a lot of space on the maritime uh, port side uh, in the United States, and so how we we work our way through this is going to be tricky. Uh, I, you know, I think it's also I mean, you can say that there has been underinvestment on, on the port side. I mean, we, we have our first container marine terminal opened up in more than a decade in Ocean Shelf, and it, it lays dormant because none of the major container lines will call it due to um, longshore lawsuit threats. So, I mean, there's a, there's definitely an issue in terms of getting these projects online. And I think you are going to see an opening for alternative ports that are not backed up into a city. Like we've seen the success of the port of Prince Rupert. Part of the reason Savannah has grown so much is because it's been able to kind of deepen its reach into the hinterland, and they don't have to deal with a huge metropolis on their back step, so they can just kind of build out these bigger and bigger big box retailer distribution hubs. Um, so I think, you know, there, there is a place for alternative ports, but as the carriers, you know, you know, you're, you're seeing the profits go down, you're seeing them tightening up shop. Um, you know, I think the reliability and the service is only going to get more challenging, and that can actually lead, lead to more consolidation on the streams. Agreed. Uh, Jason, so uh, the container shipping industry during the pandemic had record profits. I think four of the uh, shipping lines were the most uh, uh, profitable 100 companies in the world, uh, in the, in the uh, ilk of uh, Amazon and, and, and uh, other uh, Google and, and, and technology companies. Uh, any ideas where the next real, uh, strong, strong market's going to be in the, in the maritime sector? Or any, where, where are we going to see growth? Uh, uh, what's your projections? I mean, I, I look at uh, various classes of tankers primarily, so I, I guess the one that I would say um, is, is really LNG. Um, LPG is very strong right now. Um, I think LNG, you can kind of see there's this massive build out going on in the United States, so LNG is a 420 million ton a year market right now. Um, and by the end of this year, we'll have about 100 million tons of new capacity in the U.S. under construction about 50 million tons in Qatar. So that's just a massive expansion. Um, so you need 12 journeys a year per million tons, basically. So massive expansion. 
Um, the other one uh, that I think is, is, uh, is interesting, although I'm a, a little more skeptical about the future, uh, is ammonia. So you can carry ammonia on LPG carriers, and, and people are. Uh, but sort of dedicated, custom-designed, you know, ammonia carriers are the preference. Um, the issue there is the cost is a couple of times more than the cost of the commodity. Um, so everybody's like, oh, the phone is cheap. We know how to move it. It's carbon free, uh, sort of, um, depending on how you make it. Um, but the cost of moving it is, is really it, it, uh, sort of extortionate almost. Um, so you're going to need, you know, the Saudis are supposed to be building 10 to 20 million tons of new ammonia capacity. So usually you tank the global ammonia market when you add a half a million tons, maybe a million tons. It takes a couple of years for the market to sort of recover from that. Uh, so you're, you're talking again about this huge build out and ammonia being used for everything from bunkers. Uh, people are talking about making ammonia, transporting it, and then cracking it to get the uh, hydrogen out, and then burning that in power plants. So there's some pretty extravagant, very expensive plans. Um, but if you get a fraction of the ammonia going into things like power generation and bunkers, um, you're going to need a big build out of, of additional core capacity. You're going to need one of the things that's problem using it as a ship fuel is that it's toxic. So you're going to have to have better quality crews. You're going to have to have more crews uh, who know how to handle, manage, uh, carrying, you know, using. Uh, is bunker fuel. So I think those are a couple of segments, uh, at least on the energy side, uh, that are, that are going to need a lot of investment. And you're probably going to see periods of real tightness in those markets that lead to pretty high rates, uh, along the lines of what you see now. Well, I think you're going to see a bunch of interest on the container side. It's not coming up in terms of propulsion for containers. For ammonia? Yeah. You know, I mean, I think everybody, you, you, Commissioner, you mentioned it. I mean, uh, you know, everybody's looking at this variety of fuels. Um, I, I don't think there's a, a great answer. LNG, people sort of promote LNG, but LNG doesn't reduce your carbon emissions enough. So you still have to buy uh, credits if you're going to use LNG. Ammonia is toxic. Um, methanol, a lot of people think methanol is sort of the best of a lot of, um, unfortunately, sales. You know, I mean, I, I think it's going to be all of the above because I, I think you're going to have to look at where you are, what's available, the nature of the journey, the nature of the vessel, tolerance for risk of your uh, owners and charters. So I think you're probably going to see some of everything uh, in terms of fuels. Yeah, you know, it, it's, it's, it, it's incredible because we, we, we could always basically find bunker fuel anywhere. And now you may have to uh, do routing in the future in order to adjust to your, or, or services, uh, to adjust to, to your fuel sources. And so I, I think on the container side, I have a with the big lines and they're looking at LNG, but then being able to transition to another fuel. So it's not only just that your vessel uh, might take a, a particular type of fuel, but would have to adjust to, to multiple fuels as, as part of the design. So the LNG market is, is a sort of a unique and it's a, one that looks pretty good for the United States. And I, I work for Senator John Rowe and he announced, he said, uh, Carl, I want you to change the Deepwater Port Modernization Act to allow the permitting of LNG facilities. The next day I, I got to my office and there was 10 energy attorneys there on the, on the door waiting for me to open it up. And so, so we've seen a lot of, of, of movement on LNG just because of the nature of production domestic production in the United States. But it is, a, a, it's not like the tanker market where you can take petroleum anywhere in the world. Uh, it really doesn't work unless you have a gas a liquefaction uh, facility and a gasification facility. And it usually needs to, to hook into a commercial uh, pipeline system that's going to provide a lot of service to consumers. Uh, and so uh, so it's, it's, a, it's a fixed market and so it really hasn't developed uh, on the spot market uh, like the, the tanker industry. Do you think that impedes the ability to, to, to expand or will we ever get to the point where LNG's uh, ships are freely trading on the spot market? Uh, I, I'd be surprised, I mean, there's sort of 600 or so LNG tankers in the world. Yeah. Um, today they cost about $260 million to build one. 
So it's, uh, you know, they're, I mean, people buy them on spec, but they don't buy dozens of them on spec. Uh, we do, there are spot charters, we do a big business in spot charters, but I, um, but it's a, it's a fairly small percentage of the total um, that you see. You are starting to see the development of FFAs for allergy tankers and risk management tools to sort of support a more commoditized LNG market in general. Because all LNG used to be sold on long-term contracts, and, and now you get a fair amount sold into the spot market. Uh, and a lot of that goes on the, on the spot charters. Um, it's just tough because, you know, it's, it's just not with, uh, with oil tankers, we have 4,000 oil tankers, uh, we have 600 LNG tankers. Um, so there's a lot of milk runs um, that go on in LNG. Um, so I, I, I think it's evolving, but I, I think everything in LNG seems to take a long time, partly because of, of what you mentioned, that you need all the kit. Um, it's not fungible. If you don't have a receiving terminal, it doesn't matter how cheap it is or how accessible the ship is. You know, Carl, based on a lot of the conversations I've been having with the container lines, I mean, they're looking at the alternative fuels as, as a huge risk because they don't want to get caught with one particularly if fuel is their highest operating cost and probably can only become more of that larger share. Um, so I think you're going to see a lot, but I think that's going to be really challenging because you, you, you're going to have the irony of adding extra nautical miles to burn a cleaner fuel. And you're also going to have to figure out what is going to be used 25 years from now and says so you want to extend the life of your ship. I, do, I think I have enough time for a couple questions in the audience. What do you think, James? One or two. Okay, you have some questions that uh, people want to ask? Uh, we have a little more discussion on methanol. Uh, the article at NAN, or uh, methanol methanol. Yeah, I mean, methanol is, is what I'm hearing is that uh, it is the fuel that most of the container uh, lines are looking at. Uh, Maersk uh, has, has, has committed to blue methanol, green methanol. Uh, CMA. Um, yeah, and CMA. Uh, and so uh, MSC is, is, is looking at LNG transitioning, uh, potentially to buy with uh, diesel, I think, is what they're looking at. Uh, so people are, are having to make decisions now uh, based on a supply chain that's not in place. So you're building a ship for 20 years, and you're building it in the hopes that the fuel will be there. Uh, let's say you're serving South America, uh, and it's a smaller ship that's a container ship. You have to hope that they have that fuel or you're going to have to readjust. But the one, the, the worst that is out, uh, out, out of the gate fast, fastest is methanol. Yeah, and I would say that both of those carriers are investing in their own. So they're looking now at just the equipment, but creating their own supply. And that comes about a year and a half ago after MERS kind of publicly chided the energy majors of not making the investment because there's a concern not in terms of just production, but how the different shipping sectors are going to compete for this fuel with other industries. I think there's going to be competition for fuels, but there's also uh, a little bit of a wait and see because some of the regulatory schemes aren't in place yet uh, to provide kind of a safety underpinning for the new fuel models. All, all, of, these, uh, all of these participants want to find a way to share the risk. No one wants to go it alone. No one wants to get caught out. Uh, it's great to be a first mover, but generally not in this industry. And if you get caught uh, doing the right thing at the wrong time, you're out of the game. Uh, you gotta collaborate. That's, that's what the word is at all the uh, other uh, conferences I've recently attended and all the people on stage, they just say collaborate. It's very easy to say, it's very hard to do. It's a change in the DNA from what this industry has done for millennia. So we're, we're slowly moving in that direction. The biggest companies in this industry are, are uh, forming strategic partnerships, JVs, and making careful decisions around these big topics. But you're talking about trillions of dollars of capex to revitalize a fleet to get to 2050 with an all the above approach, and they have to collaborate. Well, and we're trying, we're spending a lot of time trying to figure out what the actual costs are going to be. And, and to be honest, like all the other consultants, we're kind of making it up because there's just no way to know what ammonia costs. 40 yeah. or what production of, of green methanol is going to cost you know 20 years from now so i mean you're really even if you're collaborating even if you're trying to share the risk it's very difficult to get a real read 
on, on what this is all going to cost, what your economics will look like, you know, and, and you're ordering a you know, 20, 30 year asset. You make a good point about the regulatory timeline, because I, mean, I, I think you're going to see some slippage. You're, you've already seen China and the IMO and others kind of talking to some more of the developing states, saying let's put the brakes on this. Um, and even with the IMO, they're saying, I think it's something like near zero in 2015, or 2050. Well, without bashing the Europeans, but I'll bash the Europeans. You know, they're, they're, they have the people who are talking about not using hydrocarbons in Europe after 2030, and, and it's just ludicrous. You know, and but they're still sort of going through the motions of we're going to reduce natural gas consumption by 40 percent in six years. And it's just, I mean, I don't, I mean, it'll be Disneyland with cheese and wine, I guess. But I mean, you know, they're sort of outsourcing petrochemicals to the U.S. So I mean, it's, it's you, you have these very sort of bizarre sort of mixed signals, I think, from regulators all around the world. I mean, not just the Europeans. So I, I think there's just so many moving parts with methanol or all the other groups. Well, I think we're supposed to see the stage, uh, James, but I want to thank all of the panelists. Uh, Julie Nelson, I, I know. Uh, and, uh, thanks, uh, thanks. Thank you very much, uh, Commissioner Benzel, and to each of the panelists. Uh, we're going to keep rolling. Uh